Hi everybody and welcome to our lesson on chemical reactions and we're going to talk about what goes on in chemical reactions when we get chemicals to react with other chemicals which is a fantastic topic very classic chemistry but before we do of course this is the start of the unit and so let's go to the overall organizational presentation and just see where we are in our overall thinking about chemistry for the year. So here you can see our overall chemistry organization for the year. And remember that our, our, our theme for the year is that matter is made of atoms that interact in interesting ways. And so we've looked at large groups of atoms. We've looked at the individual atom and the structure of that. And for the last couple of units, we've been dealing with looking at how atoms interact with each other. In unit six, we dealt with the periodic table and chemical bonding. And then in unit seven, we talked about compounds and how we use the chemical bonding that atoms can engage in in order to make compounds, how those compounds are thought of in terms of formulas and equations and even drawing structures. Here in unit eight, we're gonna be dealing with chemical reactions. So now we're gonna take different compounds, put them together and see how they react. And so we'll talk about writing chemical equations, talk about different types of reactions, and we'll go back to that notion of stoichiometry and we'll look at it from an equation perspective. I hope that that sounds cool to you. Let's go back to the presentation. So lesson one is all about balancing chemical equations. Up at the top, we have a diagram of a chemical reaction, a reaction between methane, CH4, and oxygen gas. And this produces carbon dioxide and water. And you can see it represented as a space filling diagram of each of those molecules. Remember, I love space filling diagrams. But you can also see the chemical equation written below it. And so you can see this is somewhat simplified, but it's really important. It's a very common way of representing what happens in chemistry. And so we need to have a handle on it. Let's go and take a look. Generally speaking, you should be familiar with each of these terms. So the stuff that's on the left side of the arrow are called the reactants, and the stuff that's on the right side of the arrow are called the products. The arrow represents the reaction. So we can just think that these reactants react with each other over the course of that arrow, and then they become the products. It's important to understand the arrow is not an equal sign, though it's often thought of like that mathematically for a lot of purposes. And the plus signs aren't addition signs. The plus signs are actually more like commas. It just lists the materials that participate in the reaction or that are produced from the reaction. You can also see that when we write this as a chemical equation, we use coefficients. We put numbers in front of the chemical formulas to represent the total number of those substances that participate in the balanced chemical reaction. A lot of times when you look at chemical reactions, though it's not being shown in this one here, you'll also get state information or phase information about what phases of matter the different substances are in. So parentheses S means solid and parentheses G means gas and parentheses L means liquid. Parentheses AQ means that it's dissolved in a water solution, an aqueous solution. It's important to understand that when we write things as chemical reactions, we absolutely have to hold to that rule of the law of conservation of mass. The total amount of mass on each side of our chemical equations has to be the same. What this really means is that there needs to be equal numbers of all of the elements in our reactants and in our products. And you can see in this particular example equation, this is done. We've got one carbon in our reactants, one in our products. We've got four hydrogens in our reactants. We've got four in our products. And we've got four oxygens as well in both our reactants and our products. A chemical reaction has happened. These atoms are now in different compounds than they were to start. And that's how we know that it was a chemical reaction. But we still have the same number of each different type of element participating in the reaction. That's incredibly important. And so this is what we call balancing a chemical reaction. It's important to understand that even if we had more than one of these substances participating in the reaction, the reactants would still react with each other according to the ratios that are set up in that balanced chemical reaction. So here you can see we've got three methane molecules and they're reacting with six oxygen gas molecules to produce three CO2s and six H2Os. It's still balanced and it's still according to that initial ratio that we set up using our coefficients. When we want to write or balance a chemical reaction, there are a couple of steps that we should always follow. And these are the steps that I'll be using and these are the steps that I would definitely expect you to use as well. The first thing is that you might be given the word equation. And so if that's the case, you need to write the formulas of all of the compounds in the equation. It's really important to stop and make sure that you have the correct formula for each of the substances. Otherwise, the reaction is just going to be totally wacky. You probably won't be able to balance it correctly, and it will just be wrong. So if you have any questions about how we write the formulas of compounds, if we're given their names, I would definitely encourage you to go back to our compounds unit and go through
through those three lessons on how to write and name binary ionic formulas, ternary ionic formulas, and simple molecular formulas. If you have any questions about that, you definitely want to get those ironed out before you move into balancing chemical reactions. Once you've figured out the formulas of each of the compounds in the equation, it's then time to balance the equation. And so the way you're going to do that is you probably want something that can erase because you're going to put down coefficients and you're going to change them. You don't want to scratch those out. Things can get really cluttered and confusing. So my advice would be to use a pencil or an erasable pen, something with an eraser. I often have have to erase coefficients myself as I go through the process of balancing a reaction and I've been doing this a lot longer than you have. You're going to balance each element one at a time. It really is that simple. You're just going to pick one to start and make sure that there's the same number of the element on both sides of the arrow. Then you're going to move on to the next one and the next one and so on. But as you do that, you'll probably find that you need to get more of the element than you have initially. And so the only way that you can do that is to change the coefficients, to change the numbers that are put in front of the chemical formula. You can never ever change the chemical formula. You cannot put a coefficient in the middle of a chemical formula. That is absolutely not allowed and is one of the most common mistakes that I see learners make as they move through this process of learning how to balance chemical reactions. As this process moves on, you're probably going to find that you need to revise the numbers of elements that you initially started with by changing the coefficients. And so that's totally normal and totally fine. That is why you use a pencil or an erasable pen. You will have to revise at some point, I guarantee it, and you wanna be able to do that cleanly so that you don't get confused as you go through the process. Finally, a good check to use when you're all done at the end is to make sure that your coefficient ratio, the ratio of the numbers in front of each substance, are the simplest whole number ratio they can be. If it is not the simplest whole number ratio that it can be, you can simplify it and it will still be balanced. So we always want that simplest whole number ratio. Does this make sense? Let's go in and try an example. So this is on page three of your unit eight packet. I want you to try this on your own before we do it together. And so I'd like you to write the balanced equation for the reaction of aluminum with oxygen to produce aluminum oxide. So pause the video, go through this on your own, and then let's go through the solution together. So let's see what this reaction looks like to start. We've got aluminum plus oxygen yielding aluminum oxide. And so now that I know that, I can figure out the formulas of each of the substances that participate in this reaction. Aluminum is just Al, oxygen is O2, and aluminum oxide has the formula Al2O3. What I've done here is I've represented each of these different substances diagrammatically as different kinds of atoms, which I'm just representing as small circles colored different ways. So my oxygen is red and my aluminum is blue, and you can see how I put them together in each of the different substances. The biggest trick here to remember is that oxygen is one of those Brinkelhoff elements, and so when it's by itself, it travels in pairs. That's actually going to affect things as we go through the balancing. Now that we've got that, let's go through the process of balancing this equation. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to balance my oxygens. It seems like the most complex thing to do. And so if we look at this, in order to get an equal number of oxygens on both sides, I start with two in my reactants and three in my products. I need to have six in both. So I'm going to put a three in front of the O2 in my reactants to give me three O2 molecules for a total of six oxygen atoms, and a two in front of the Al2O3 in my products in order to give me two aluminum oxide formula units, each with three oxygen atoms. Now that I've done that, I just have to balance my aluminums. I've got one in my reactants, and I've currently got four in my products. So I'm going to put a four in front of the aluminum in my reactants. This is the balanced equation. So when this is all said and done, this is what we should have written down. You don't have to have the diagrams under the equation, but I find it very helpful. And that's actually what we're going to discuss in a second. Let's look at what we just did and let's see if we can come up with some pro tips that we can follow as we think about how to go about balancing reactions. These are some things that I've learned over my time and hopefully by passing them on to you, you'll become a much more expert balancer as well. The first thing is to balance singleton elements last. So any element that occurs by itself, you wanna balance last. That's why I left the aluminum till the end because the aluminum was by itself in the reactants. The reason we wanna do that is because if it's a singleton on one side, we can then count up how many we have on the other side and just easily adjust the coefficient in front of the singleton in order to get that many on the side where it appears by itself. The second tip is that if we have a polyatomic ion, which we didn't in our first example, and it remains intact on both sides of the arrow, you can balance it as a unit. 
So if I had a nitrate in my reactants and in my products, I could just treat that nitrate as one solid unit and just balance that overall. I don't need to balance the individual elements inside of that polyatomic ion. And our last tip, and this is my own suggestion, is that it's usually helpful to draw simple diagrams for each substance. And so that's what I've done in this first example. That's what I'll continue to do as we go through this lesson. You don't have to do this, but I find that it's very helpful. And so if you want to do this, it's really very easy. Just choose some simple shapes that make sense to you and use shading or not shading. And you can definitely work your way through any of the equations that you'll be given to balance. Let's try another example that uses some of our pro tips that we just talked about. So this is on page five of our unit eight packet. I'd like you to write the balanced equation for the reaction of aluminum with copper two sulfate to produce aluminum sulfate and copper. Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through it together. So this is the reaction that I'm dealing with in this equation. I need to figure out the formulas of each of these substances and then balance them. The formulas for each of these substances are written here and I've represented them diagrammatically as follows. I'm going to pick something to balance first, but I'm going to leave the singletons by themselves. So that means I'm going to leave aluminum and copper until the end. I'll do those in either order at the end. The only thing that occurs as a compound in both my reactants and my products is sulfate. So let's balance the sulfates first. I've got one in my reactants and I've got three in my products, which means I need to have three total at least in my reactants as well. So I'm going to put a three in front of the copper sulfate. Now I've got three sulfates in both my reactants and my products. You can see that now I've got an unequal number of aluminums and coppers, but it should be very easy to balance those because they do exist as singletons on the side where they're not in the different compounds. So I can just count them up in the compound and then put the coefficient in front of the singletons. When we do this, we're gonna put a three in front of the copper in our products in order to get three copper ions on our product side. And we're going to put a two in front of the aluminum in our reactants in order to get two in our reactant side. And so this is going to be the balanced equation. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, take a moment and write down any questions that you have before we wrap up. Thanks so much for watching our first discussion in our reactions unit about writing and balancing chemical equations. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can represent chemical reactions as chemical equations. If you're given a description of a reaction, you need to be able to represent that as a chemical equation in the way that we've done in this particular presentation. Also make sure that you can balance chemical equations. Once you're given the reaction, please make sure that once you write the equation, you can then use the balancing rules to write the balanced chemical equation. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment, write down any questions that you have. You can always leave those questions below the video or get in touch with me. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.